Kicking off a brand new series today, uh, a brand new series where we are asking one very simple question, and this is the question, what makes you happy? Because even when I ask you the question, my assumption is you have more questions than answers when I ask you this question, because when I say what makes you happy, your answer is, well, when? Do you mean what makes me happy right now? Do you mean what used to make me happy? Do you mean what will make me happy tomorrow? Do you mean what will make me happy for the next week? Do you mean what will make me happy for the next month? What will make me happy for the next year? Because there's this thing that we've all sort of learned as we've gone through life. There's this truth about happiness. We've come to grips with the idea that what works today might not work tomorrow. We just understand that the things that made me happy as a kid don't make me happy anymore. When I was a kid, cartoons made me very happy. Now, well, they still kind of make me happy. But when I was a kid, riding my bike made me happy. Now, riding a bike is exercise, and that doesn't make me as happy. Uh, you know, but, but you understand this in life. Maybe you got a new car, and then the, you know, the new car broke, and so it didn't make you happy anymore. Maybe, maybe when you got married, you looked at that person in the eyes as you said, I do, and you're like, you're going to make me happy for the rest of my life, and then they didn't. Because that's not how it works. Maybe you had kids and you thought, my kids will make me happy. Ha, 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 That's the funniest thing I ever said. <laughs> but no, we sort of understand, right, this idea when you talk about happiness, we kind of view happiness as, as this thing we have to chase, and, and maybe we find it, and maybe we hold it for just a moment, and then something changes, and we have to keep chasing it, and we have to keep moving. And the reason that we want to do this entire series is because when I think about happy, and when you think about happy, and when you all think about happy, I believe there are many thoughts about happy. You have thoughts, I have thoughts, we all have thoughts about happy. But there's not a lot of clarity around happy. I don't even know if we can define it for ourselves or, or if we can define it for other people. So what I wanted to do today is just to start, because this is the first week of a series, we're kind of introing this whole idea, is before we even get about what makes you happy, I want to take a step back and let's just define happy. How do you define happiness? How do I define happiness? And when you begin to study this, you find out people have been trying to answer this question since the beginning of time, poets, theologians, philosophers have been wrestling with this idea, what is happy, how do we get happy, how do we feel happy, how do we stay happy. We've all been wrestling with this. And in fact, about, about 20 years ago, uh, science began studying and trying to answer the question of happiness and what happy is. There's a branch of psychology. It's called positive psychology. And they've actually studied, they, they, they've applied the scientific method to happiness. And they really try to dig down and try to understand what is happiness. And they've actually come up with a definition of happiness. Uh, and so what I want to do today, is I just kind of wanted to start out with this definition so we all kind of started from the same page. Here's how uh, this group of science, uh, uh, positive psychology, here's how they define happiness. Here's what they say. More than simply positive mood, happiness is a state of well-being that encompasses living a good life, that is, with a sense of meaning and deep satisfaction. Now, I think it's fascinating to me that the very first thing they say is that happiness is more than simply a positive mood. Happiness is more than just this temporary joy you get from thing to thing. Happiness is a state of well-being. And that state of well-being comes from living a good life, a life with meaning and deep satisfaction. And they, they keep going. They say, research shows that happiness is not the result of bouncing from one joy to the next. 
Achieving happiness typically involves times of considerable discomfort. Now, we don't think about that when we think of, of happy. But when you step back and actually listen to what they're saying, it makes sense. And not only does it make sense, it's actually better if you think about it. Because think about it, which is better, just temporary moments that you have to chase or to actually be able to achieve a state of well-being to live in a state of, of contentment, to live in a state of satisfaction. And look at this. It says even, even, even involving times of considerable discomfort. So what science has discovered is, is true happiness, to truly be happy, is more than just a temporary thing you chase. It's this sense and this state of well-being that you can actually be happy even when things are bad. That you can be happy despite your circumstances. Now, let's forget for a moment you're in a church. Let's forget for a moment that we're going to talk about God in a minute. Let's say you don't believe in God. Let's, let's throw all that off the table. Let's just talk about happiness. And let's just talk about that definition. Happiness is a state of well-being where you can feel contentment and satisfaction regardless of what's happening. Now, whether you believe in God or not, doesn't that sound better? then however you define happy for yourself. Doesn't that sound better? Doesn't that sound like something you would want to chase? See, we believe it sounds better. And not only do we believe it sounds better, we believe that it is God's ideal and God's plan for our life. And that's why we're starting this series, and we're going to get to God in just a moment. But, but before we do, I want to stick with science for a moment because, because they've really studied this a great deal. And in fact, out, at, um, out in California, at, there's, a, there's a university out there. It's called UC Berkeley. And they actually have a center there that is called the Greater Good Science Center. And all they do is study happiness. They study happiness. They study what makes you happy. They study best practices for being happy. And again, they've applied the scientific method to happiness. And here is what this group has come up with. Their definition is a little different than the psychology today, but it basically says the same thing. Here's how they define happiness. Happiness is the experience of joy, contentment, or positive well-being combined with a sense that one's life is good, meaningful, and worthwhile. Now, again, forget about God. We're not talking about God. We're talking about science. Doesn't that sound better? Isn't that what we're all really looking for? Joy, contentment, positive well-being, a good, meaningful, and worthwhile life. Wouldn't we all agree that if that was how we talked about ourselves and that was what we experienced in our life, we would say we were happy? Well, now, the, the Greater Good Science Center doesn't just define happiness. Their main work is to figure out how to be happy. So they have done research, they've done studies, they've done experiments, and they have actually come up with some best practices, some things you can do in your life. And what they've determined is scientifically, if you do these things in your life, you will achieve this happiness. You will experience joy, contentment, positive well-being, and you will have a sense that your life is good, meaningful, and worth. Wow, they, they've discovered this. And here's what they say you should do. They say you should think positively. Think good thoughts. Think, think happy thoughts. Spend time with people you love. Spend time with family and friends. Uh, give thanks. Be joyful. Be, be appreciative for things that have happened. Practice kindness. Be kind to other people. Don't hold grudges. Manage money properly. Again, anyone in this room want to say, if you did these things, your life would be worse. <laughs> Anybody look at that list and say, well, that looks miserable. No, you look at that list and you're like, you know what? Yeah, man, if I did those things in my life, man, I bet, I bet I'd feel better. I bet I'd be more, more content. more. So yeah, I get it. I would probably be happier. I understand that. Okay, so that's science's approach to happiness. And I bring that up because we're going to move to God's approach to happiness. But I have to address something because some of you, um, you may, may be like me, and maybe you were brought up in church. Um, I was brought up in church, and, and from a very early age, I remember being taught, or at least feeling like I was taught, that God was at odds with my happiness. 
In fact, I can remember being taught this phrase. God doesn't care about your happiness. Anybody, don't, don't raise your hand, but was anybody ever taught that? It was like, it was like when I was in uh, elementary school, middle school, and high school, it would always come up in the context of, hey, God says don't do this. And then somebody would say, but I want to do that. That sounds fun. That would make me happy. And the person would always respond, God doesn't care about your happiness. And then they added this line. He cares about your holiness. Now, holiness just means uh, doing what God wants, not what you want. And the problem with this line is that it was always brought up in such a way to make you feel like you had to pick one or the other. That happiness and holiness were at odds with each other. And it made it sound like that this God who was up there in the universe didn't really care about us, didn't really want to know us personally, didn't really want to know what we thought, what we felt, what we wanted, that he was just kind of some arbitrary rule giver who loved to be up there and say, watch what I'll get them to do today. And that he would just come up with these rules to try to harm us, to try to hurt us, to try to keep us from doing what we wanted. And, and that, that our personal happiness was in direct conflict with what God wanted for our life. Now, if you have that view of God, if you were taught that view of God on behalf of God, and on behalf of every minister and every preacher who ever said that to you, I want to stand here today and say, I'm sorry. I apologize from the bottom of my heart because, of course, God cares about your happiness. The entire reason he sent his son to rescue you, the entire reason he wants to have a relationship with you, the entire reason he has a plan for your life is in service of your happiness. He wants you to live happy. He wants you to feel happy. He wants you to be happy. And to, to put holiness and happiness up against each other like they have to compete is spiritual malpractice. And I apologize from the bottom of my heart. Because here's basically the bottom line of the whole series. Typically, when I start a new series, week one, I do an intro message. At the very end, I give you a bottom line, and we work through it for the rest of the series. Today, I'm going to give you the bottom line right up at the top. Because the bottom line is that important. And this is what we're going to talk about for the next four weeks. Especially if you have ever been taught that God is at odds with your happiness. I hope you will hear this today, and it will begin to set you free. Because here's the reality. The pursuit of holiness is the path to happiness. And by holy again, I just mean the pursuit of God. The decision to say God's ways are right, my ways are wrong, and when they're in conflict, I trust Him. God, I love you. God, I will follow you. God, I trust you. The pursuit of God, the pursuit of holiness is the path to happiness. And I know you want to push back. You want to say, whoa, whoa, whoa. What you, sounds like what you're saying is that my path to happy is to give over control of my life to someone else and to listen to them and to follow them and do what they want rather than what I want. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And you want to push back again. And it's like, well, no, 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 no. That, that, that can't be. Who would do that? Who, who would ever do that? Who would ever wish that on someone? Well, I have a question for you. How many of you are parents? Don't raise your hand. Any, any parents in the room? Do you allow your children to do whatever they want? But don't you love them? Don't you want them to be happy? Why don't you let them do whatever? The, why don't you let them play in the road? Why don't you let them take that fork and stick it in the socket in the wall? Don't you love them? Don't you, don't you want them to be happy? Of course you do. You love them so much that you actually spend time 
and effort and energy creating an environment for them to be safe. And you give them rules and you give them boundaries and you give them protections so that they can't hurt themselves too much. And you spend time teaching them. And as, you grow, as they grow and get older, you give them less boundaries and less protections. But your entire goal, your entire point is to raise them so that they can become fully functioning adults who don't harm themselves or others and move out of your house. Amen. <laughs> now again, again, if you can understand the concept of a parent, if you can understand how a parent has to use their knowledge and their love for their children and sometimes tell them no to things and sometimes give them boundaries because it's all in an effort to love them and protect them and to keep them safe and to give them a happy life, if you can understand that concept, which we all can, you understand your gracious, loving, Heavenly Father. And you understand the lengths to which he's gone to make your life better. And so what we want to do in this series is not just convince you that statement is true, but to teach you over the next four weeks how to begin to follow God in every area of your life. Because you may not be convinced today, and I understand that, but, but let's say you are at least interested, you're at least open to, okay, so... That does kind of make sense, pursuit of holiness, path to happiness. So how do I, how do I pursue holiness? And again, maybe you know some of the Bible. Maybe you've, maybe you've read the Old Testament. Maybe you've read the New Testament. Maybe you've read the Ten Commandments, and you're like, okay, so should I follow the Ten Commandments? Or maybe you've read the more of God's rules, and you realize there's over 600 commandments in the Old Testament, and you're like, oh, my goodness, i got to follow 600 commandments. How do I do that? That's a lot of commands. I don't know what to do. Uh, but you're, you're open to this idea of, okay, let, let, I'm willing to pursue this, but 600 seems daunting. I don't really know how to start this process. Well, the good news for you is that's why we have Jesus. It's why God sent him. God sent Jesus to give us an entry point to holiness, to give us an entry point, which, again, holiness just simply means a relationship with God. And while Jesus was on the earth, this was a discussion they had all the time because they were still wanting to know, hey, do some of these matter more than the others? Which one should we really follow? And actually, one time, there were these guys, they were the religious leaders of the day, and, and they would try to trick Jesus, which I just think is, is remarkable to me. Like, he was the Son of God, and they thought they could outthink the Son of God. And they would always use God's own words to out outthink the Son of God. And I'm like, he wrote those words. What are you doing? But they would try to do it all the time. And one time they tried to trick Jesus, and they asked him a question. They said, hey, Jesus, what's the most important thing God ever said? And what they were hoping is that he was going to say something that they could use against him to accuse him. But Jesus, because he's Jesus, used that opportunity to speak through them to us and to give us the simplest, clearest path towards him and his heavenly father that was ever given. Because what he basically does is he summarizes everything God's ever said into two phrases. And he's like, hey, this is it. If you, th these two things. These two things. If you can pursue these things, if you can do these things, if you can, if you can want these things, this is going to be your, your, your pursuit of holiness. And I promise you, it'll produce happiness. So what I'd love to do today is I would love to take you through this story. I'd love to take you through this encounter and show you what Jesus says. And then I want to show you why I believe that this can lead to happiness. And then I'm going to give you an opportunity at the end to take a step. I don't know what the step is, but to take a step. A step towards holiness, which I believe will lead to happiness. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew is the first book in the New Testament. Uh, Matthew is written by a guy named Matthew. Matthew was... Uh, one of Jesus' disciples, he was an eyewitness to these events. He saw these things happen, then he wrote them down. And here's how he records this encounter. In Matthew chapter 22, starting in verse 36, he says this. This person comes to Jesus and they say, Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Which is the most important one? Jesus, which do you think matters the most? Now, this is a trick question because it's like asking a parent, you know, which child is your favorite? Like, you don't answer the question. My wife answers the question, but I don't answer the question. You know, my wife's answer is, depends on the day, which I understand. But my, kid, my boys, they know that. Like, they, I, I want them to fight to be my favorite. You know, I'm like, it's up to you guys. It is a fantastic parenting strategy. You know, I'm like, have at it. Who wants to be dad's favorite today? I'm just kidding. 
I'm just kidding, but yeah, I don't. That's actually, whatever. We'll talk about it later. <laughs> but you know, it's one of those, you know, there wasn't supposed to be a most important. And so they thought they were going to trap Jesus. But then he answers this way. He says, Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. He says, it's easy. Love God with everything you have. Now, that doesn't just mean, like, love, like, feel special about God. It doesn't just mean think God's great. What he's saying is love God with all your heart, with all your emotion, with all your soul, with who you are, and with all your mind. Love God. Submit all those things to God. Pick God above them. In essence, what he's really saying is, in all things, at all times in your life, give God the benefit of the doubt. That's what he's saying. When you're confused, trust God. When you don't feel like doing it, trust God. When you think you have a better idea, trust God. When your friends and family don't know what you're doing, trust God. He's saying, above anything else and all else, the most important thing you can do in your life is to decide once for all time, God's right, I'm wrong. And when there is conflict, I will follow him. It's pretty good. Jesus says that, and the teachers of religious law are like, man, that's pretty good. Wow, you are smart. And the people listening are like, man, that was really good. And they kind of think he's done because they said, what's the most important? And Jesus answered. And before they could even say something else, Jesus keeps talking. And he says, a second is equally important. And they were like, I'm sorry, what now? Because the first one was really good. I got to give it to you, man. Trust God above all. Follow God above all. Love God above all. That's really good. Now you're saying there's another one? And it's as equally important as the first one? Like it's not one and two, it's one A and one B, like you're saying they're the same? And Jesus is like, yep. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. So what Jesus is saying is, not only is it crucial that you trust God, follow God, put God up here and follow Him every day of your life, but that as you go about your life, that you treat other people as you would want them to treat you. That you spend your life loving and serving other people. That you spend your life seeking to make the lives of other people better. So follow God, love God, trust God, and love people, serve people, help people, put other people first. They asked for one, they got two. And then Jesus says this, he says, the entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. In other words, everything my father has ever said, everything Jesus would say that I'm going to say, everything you'll ever read, everything can all be summed up, will all tie back, will all be wrapped around, love God and love people. That is the greatest commandment. And everything else my dad's ever said is based on those two and stems from those two things. So for our purposes today, what that means is if you want a happy life, if you want the happiness we've been talking about, God's path is very simple. Follow him and love other people. Trust him and help other people. Serve him and serve other people. To decide right now, once for all time, God, you are right. God, you can be trusted. God, your ways are better than my ways, and I'm going to spend my life following you. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to walk where you tell me to walk, and as I'm walking, I'm going to do my best to treat other people how you treat me. I'm going to love other people. I'm going to serve other people. I'm going to forgive other people. I'm going to try to make the lives of other people better. And if Jesus were right here today, he would say, great, then you will be happy. And that just doesn't sound right to us, to us does it? We want to push back. 
because we still think happiness is a thing. And we still think, eh, but that's not going to make me happy. The, 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 the car would make me happy. Or, yeah, but you don't understand because I really want to buy this house. And that's really going to make me happy. Or I really want to do this. Or I really want to do that. Man, if she would just date me, then, then I'd really be happy. Or if he would just date me. Or if she would just break up with me, then I'd really be happy. Or, you know. <laughs> See, we want to push back. Because we're so wired to believe that happiness changes. That happiness is a thing. But remember, we all agreed that science had it right. We all agreed that that wasn't the way to achieve happy. We all agreed that happiness was a state of well-being. That happiness was a state of well-being that was filled with, 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 with meaning and contentment and with satisfaction. And so when you say, I don't know about loving God and helping people, I don't know, well, but, 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 but we decided that happiness was bigger and broader and better than what we really think. And in fact, we all agreed that we'd be given a template by science to, to meet it. Remember? Remember? We were taught to do these things by the Greater Good Science Center. Think positively. Spend time with people you love. Give thanks. Practice kindness. Don't hold grudges. Manage money properly. We all agreed, man, if we did those things, we'd be... Happy. Now, maybe some of you know where I'm going with this. Maybe not. See, if the pursuit of holiness is the path to happiness, guess what? Every single thing on this list is a principle from God. Every single thing on this list revolves around loving God and loving people. Let me show you the best science could come up with. Think positively. Okay? Think positively. Yes, that sounds good. I wonder if God has anything to say about thinking positively. Turns out, yes, he does. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. This is a command from a guy named Paul, writing on behalf of God himself, commanding you to fix your thoughts and think about good things. How about the next one? Spend time with people you love. Does God say anything about that? Turns out, yes, he does. Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. And if one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. It is a command for community. It is a command to surround yourself with people you love. What else about this list do you think God has anything to say about? Give thanks. You think God has anything to say about giving thanks? Let's, let's see. Give thanks to the Lord, for He's good. His faithful love endures forever. This is from the Old Testament, from First Chronicles, and was actually a command. This next one, practice kindness. You think God says anything about practicing kindness? Let's see. Be kind to each other. Tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Just as God through Christ has forgiven you, as you have a relationship with Jesus, as you become more like Jesus, you do these things. As you love God, it makes it easier to love people. That's what Jesus is saying. What's the next one? Don't hold grudges. Guess what? Same verse. Let's go back. Be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. What about money? What about money? Manage money properly. It's a key to happiness, we're told. Guess what? Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud, not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. Use money to do good. That sounds like managing it properly, doesn't it? They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. So let's go back to the list. Let's go back to the best science could come up with. And hear me, I'm not belittling science. I'm just saying they could have just read his book. Because <laughs> it was right there. Now see, I'm a little different than, than some pastors and, and even Christians. Um, I embrace science. I'm not afraid of science. I'm not afraid of anything because anything science is going to prove, anything science is going to discover, is just more proof that I have a Savior who created the world. And the fact that science can empirically test 
and prove that God's way is best? I just, I mean, have at it. We knew that. I'm glad you did the research. I'm glad you discovered it for yourself. Because God's way is best. Everything on that list is a command or a principle from our Heavenly Father. It is an invitation to say, just come follow me. Just come trust me. Because I have a better life planned for you than you can possibly imagine. And I even gave secular scientists the ability to prove it independent of me. Because my methods work. My plan is best because I built you. I created you. I know what makes you tick. I know what's going to make you feel better. And you can trust me. So, here's the question. What makes you happy? My prayer is that the answers begin to shift in our time today. And I'm not, I'm not saying it shifted completely. This is week one. We have three more weeks of this series. We have three more weeks we want to talk about this. And this is a process. You have to think through this. You have to pray through this. You have to understand this. But I'm telling you, the more you begin to embrace the truth we've talked about today, the better your life will be. Because the pursuit of holiness is the path to happiness. Holy leads to happy. So here's my challenge. You have been pursuing and chasing happiness your way your entire life. If it's worked, if you are perfectly happy right now, change nothing. But if you're not, why not give God the next four weeks? I'm not asking for four months. I'm not asking for four years. Four weeks. You're already 25% of the way down. You're here. It's just three more. Four weeks to say, all right, God, I'm willing to be open. I'm willing to trust you. Okay, I'm willing to pursue you. I'm willing to pursue holy if that's the path to happy. Again, think about it. Four weeks for a lifetime of happiness. That seems like a very fair trade to me. So decide right now to pursue holy for the next four weeks. And I don't know what that looks like for you. I, I, I don't. But I know we all, every single day, have a step we can take towards holiness. We have a step we can take towards our Heavenly Father. Maybe that's inviting Him into your life. Maybe that's choosing to forgive someone. Maybe that's choosing to love someone that's unlovable. Maybe that's choosing to step up and serve in some capacity. Maybe that's choosing to be obedient in some area. I don't know what that step is for you, but you probably do. You think about it every time you come on our parking lot. And then you leave and you say, I'll do it next week. Today's an opportunity for you to take a step, a step towards holy on your journey towards happy. So as we pray and as we sing one last song, I'm just going to leave it in your hands. It's up to you. I can't take the step for you. But I can pray that, that God will come alongside you and partner with you. I know for some of you, you want to talk this out with someone. Maybe you want to pray with someone. So as we sing, we're going to have folks down front. We're going to have a prayer team here trained and ready to talk with you and to pray with you and do whatever they can to come alongside you as you take this step. Because I'm telling you, folks, the pursuit of holiness really is the path to happiness. It really is. And you will only become convinced of it when you try it for yourself. So today, whatever it is, take your step towards holy and begin your journey to happy. Let me pray. God, we love you so much. God, we just thank you for the clarity of your word. We thank you that you love us and you want the best for us. God, I pray right now that you will fill our hearts with courage and with wisdom and with clarity on what the next step should be. Father, may we take our step towards you, take a step towards holy in our pursuit of happy. May we never be the same. 
because we had an encounter with you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.